you're saying what a great job I did recruiting. I tried to recruit a kid from from outside of Pittsburgh one time when I was at Wake Forest. His son was he was a son of a coach, a hell of a player, and a damn guy goes to Pittsburgh. <laughs> This is the Sean Miller Podcast, presented by Deer Park Roofing. Now, here's your hosts, Paul Fritchner and Adam Baum, with the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller. Welcome into another episode of the Sean Miller Podcast. Paul Fritchner alongside Adam Baum and the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller. We are joined this week by a very special guest, the former head coach of the Xavier Musketeers and athletic director extraordinaire, Bob Stack. Bob, it's great to be joined by you this week. And as always, we want to make sure that we thank our presenting sponsor here on the Sean Miller Podcast, Deer Park Roofing, as well as the official payroll sponsor of the Sean Miller Podcast, our friends at Payroll Partners, and of course at TGE Solar. Bob, it's great to see you. It's great to talk to you. You were the head coach here at Xavier from 1979 to 1985. You were the athletic director from 79 to 84. Uh, you had an 88 and 86 overall record, but in your last three years here at Xavier, you were 60 and 32. During your time here, you coached eight different players that went on to score 1,000 points and uh, just such a prolific coaching career and somebody that I, I really think a lot of people would attribute the history of Xavier basketball and, and the success that this program has continued to enjoy here in this modern era really started with you taking over this program back in the late seventies. So uh, you're also a Xavier hall of famer. It's, it's good to hear from you. How are you doing? Where are you currently? And uh, just tell us a little bit about how you're doing. Uh, I'm doing well. Um, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, close to grandkids got two, uh, young ones. And, um, I work for the Miami heat as a uh, scout and, uh, I've done that for the last seven years. I was eight years prior with the Orlando magic coaching the uh, NBA for 12 years, uh, after leaving college basketball. And, um, it really, uh, warms my heart to share time with Sean and you guys about the Xavier basketball program. It's something that I follow closely, uh, something that I feel that, uh, put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into, and I'm glad that it has, you know, uh, happened over the years to have the success it has. And it has, uh, it really is a tribute to the people that have followed me and the people have carried on that tradition. You know, Coach, um, I think that what I'd love to uh, start with in me talking to you is, you know, really the beginning, the evolution of when you came to Xavier a little bit about how that happened. I've heard the story from you before. I think it's an incredible story. I think Dr. Daly, who I got to know when I was here the first time, uh, was uh, was a fixture in a lot of those moments uh, back back then, or at least he, he talked a lot about it, talked a lot about you. But just, you know, some of those early days, Schmidt Fieldhouse, the staff you had, and then what I find remarkable is how well you guys recruited at a time when the university looked much different. Obviously, you didn't have the CentOS Center. Even the conference affiliation, I think bringing back all that to life for everybody is really interesting if you love Xavier basketball. Well, you know, it was um, – I was here on a recruiting trip when I was an assistant at the University of Pennsylvania. And um, uh, as I'm getting on the plane to leave uh, was when uh, Tay Baker had resigned – and um, I, I, on the plane right back to Philadelphia, I thought about, you know, what would this job be like? And I, I figured, you know, being in Cincinnati, uh, being, you know, uh, close to Indiana, Kentucky, the state of Ohio, um, Xavier had an Eastern background uh, in the past, playing against a lot of the, uh, the Catholic schools, you know, Canisius, Niagara, Villanova. Um, and all those St. Joseph's, um, I thought it'd be a great recruiting base with that area and what the Eastern ties were and my ties in the East. And, uh, I just thought it would be a great opportunity. And, um, you know, I, I pursued with Bill Daly, who I, I, uh, came to be very, very good friends and miss him to yes. this day. Um, we used to have a lot of laughs together and, um, uh, I remember him picking me up uh, in uh, his Volkswagen 
um, it was, you know, sleeting or something. It was like almost had, I had to put my hand out of the front window to wipe off the ice off the wind, windshield coming from the airport. And I, I thought this might be an omen. Um, interviewed, got the job, came back. Um, we lost in the Final Four uh, to Michigan State and then to Paul in consolation round, came back. Uh, I had missed the plane to go to the press conference to come in. So uh, I didn't get off to a very good start. I remember Father Mulligan uh, had to postpone some <laughs> arrangements with much more important things than me uh, to make it to the press conference. I finally did make it. Um, I hadn't seen the office during the interview. So uh, Bill showed me the, uh, the the basketball coach's office. Sean, you're you're in a palace right now. Right, right. No, yeah. I, I, I realize that. Oh, yeah. I, I'm telling you. What I had, I walked in. And it was like in the, in the corner of Schmidt Field House, right by the door yeah. to the football stadium. And it was cold. And I walked in. There was a Coke, uh, Coke machine in the corner. There was a phone on the wall, a rickety desk and chair. And I said, I, I was trying to recruit LaSalle Thompson, who later went to Texas. Yeah. First recruit. I said, you think I'm going to bring LaSalle Thompson in here? and try to sell him and come to Xavier to play basketball in a major college program, uh, we have to make an adjustment here. Well, by the end of the afternoon, Bill had me in the sports center, at O'Connor Sports Center, in a different office, you know, different furniture, the whole nine yards. And that was the begin of, beginning of the commitment that Xavier uh, had made to establishing a program. I had certain ideas uh, they really bought in. I had great cooperation from the administration, from the fan base, from the uh, alumni. Uh, we established the All for One Club, which now is the, the, the founding group of the uh, fundraising uh, at the university. And uh, things have just you know moved on. We moved into league affiliation. Uh, we moved from the, th- the field house to the gardens. Uh, and then, you know, now in the, a beautiful uh, Cintas Center. And I, first time I walked in there with Jim Asim, who was a retired police uh, officer in Cincinnati, became a good friend. And that was the type of base we had, the older guys uh, around the city. And um, I walked into there and I, I had tears in my eyes. It was a beautiful venue. Couldn't be better. I was so happy for the university and so happy for the success that, uh, you know, Sean has had a, a great deal of, to, to do about and has continued on. I'm very happy about it. You know, Coach, uh, even when I when I was at Xavier the last time, uh, you know, some 15, 18 years ago, if we go back to it, when Dr. Daly would be around or just historians of Xavier basketball, they always talk about your, your recruiting class. And when you read about it, everybody in one recruiting class actually got drafted in, in the NBA. And I'm just curious, and that, that obviously took a lot of work. Who was on your staff? Who is that class that they refer to? And is it true that they all became, that they all were drafted in the NBA? Yes. Uh, my staff was um, Wayne Morgan, who uh, I had known. He was an assistant at uh, Dartmouth and went, left us and went to Syracuse. Uh, with Jim Beheim, did a great job for us, particularly recruiting um, in the New York area, the, the Northeast. And then I had Tom Orth, who was a uh, Xavier alumnus. Uh, I had met him when he was assistant at Cornell. And then I brought uh, Tom Crowley from Penn, who played for us there, uh, was a graduate assistant uh, my last year at, at Penn. And um so, you know, we, we put together a, a staff that I thought had the right idea as to how we wanted to build a program with uh, good kids, uh, guys that wanted to get a degree, and um, guys that could play. Um, we had um, our first guy we signed was, was John Shimko, a first-team All-Ohio player from uh, St. Ignatius in Cleveland, uh, who was like a – just a hard nose, hard rock, you know, much like you, Sean, when you played. Uh, tough guy, played the right way, um, and was a great influence on our whole program during the course of his four years. Um, and we had uh, 
Jeff Jenkins from Waquaic High School in New Jersey, a first term all state in New Jersey. Uh, we signed him and then we got, got lucky. Um, Victor Fleming, a twin brother of Vern Fleming, who played in yeah. Georgia. Wanted, he wanted to sign the same day that, that Vern signed. And uh, somehow Georgia got him away from Louisville. Uh, Vern uh, signed with them. And we were in the home uh, that night after we signed Jeff. And we were able to sign Victor, who was a first team all all uh, New York City public league uh, player from Long Island City High School. And then we had to wait a while for the guy we really wanted to bring in um, as, a, as a keynote uh, to our recruiting class was Dexter Bailey from Summit Country Day in Cincinnati. He was player of the year uh, in Ohio and um, uh, was it got down to us in Ohio State at the end. And we were back and forth for like a couple, three weeks. And he finally uh, uh, listened to me and did the right thing and came to Xavier and uh, all those guys got drafted. Uh, Victor in the second round by Portland. Jeff the fourth round by uh, Seattle. Um, Dexter in the ninth round uh, by Denver. And John Chimko uh, by Cleveland in the 10th round. So we we're very happy. We did a little finagling at the end to get some of it back in the day when they, <laughs> they had 10 rounds. And now they only have two. So um those things you know don't what, though, that's amazing. It really is amazing. And, and you know, I, I really think that the foundation of success at Xavier, Coach, even, you know, then you left, those that followed you, you know, Coach Gillen, Coach Prosser, and obviously then we had the Centos Center, you know, Thad Mata, myself, Coach Mack. And when you really follow that lineage, we would always say, like, we have no excuses in recruiting based on where these guys before us began. You're trying to sell Schmidt Field House, a much different conference, a much different time. Even the campus itself, there wasn't much to it. And, you know, to convince an all New York City player to come here, I don't think everybody truly understands how difficult and challenging that would be because that same young person had a lot of other good choices, which I would think back then, especially maybe other Catholic schools, but other facilities that were brighter, bigger you know, conferences that would even be different. And, but I think it's that foundation where it made it okay for good players to come here. It allowed, you know, all those that followed you to be able to recruit. And then you point to other stories like Tyrone Hill. You think about the difference of Tyrone Hill coming to Xavier versus him not, you know, Byron Larkin. And it's those guys that you mentioned and some of these other guys that I think really set the tone to make it okay for future talented young people to come to Xavier. Well, I, I think that's true. And I, I think, um, yeah, I think we did a good job. Our staff did a good job of really setting the tone for that to have guys like a Tyrone Hill, a Byron Larkin, um, Walter McBride, some of the local yeah. guys. Then we got a Ralph Lee from Baltimore, Eddie Johnson from Baltimore, uh, Richie Harris from Long Island City, who was uh, in the same neighborhood as, as Victor Fleming. So we, we kind of used, you know, the background and the, the, the luck that we had with those early guys to kind of establish a trend and make it attractive for guys. And then as we moved from Schmidt to Cincinnati Gardens and then development of, of uh, the Centos Center and so forth, I mean, it really just the progression was great. And, you know, we're very happy that, that it turned out that way because um, I, I never should have left Xavier to begin with, uh, but I'm glad that what we left uh, was a foundation uh, to build on to something that really has turned into one of the top major Coach, um, Among the many things that brings you joy in life, I would have to imagine that seeing some of the guys you mentioned, Richie, Ralph, Richie Harris, Ralph Lee, how well they're doing in life, what they've become post basketball. When you when you reflect back to recruiting them, coaching them, right in Schmidt Field House when they're 18, 19, 20 years old, and now you see where they are in life and what they're doing, that must bring you amazing amount of joy. It, it really does. I mean, I, I really am very happy that that however I was able to influence them and in, in their maturation and and moving on uh, to what they've become. You know, all of them are doing great. And uh, 
uh, I can't be more happy than than I am about how, you know how they've developed and the loyalty that they have to me and to the university and to the basketball program. I think uh, you know I, I talk to them uh, periodically. Uh, you know, Steve Wolf's another one um, yep. that uh, you know has gone on and done great things and. Gary Mass is one of the vice presidents of the university. Yeah. And, um, it just, you know, I mean, all those guys have done such a great job of moving out in their lives and having great families and making contributions, not only to the community, but to Xavier itself. Yeah. No, it's uh, that, that's quite a group. I mean, when you think about it in, uh, and I, I, again, when I, when I think of Xavier, whether I was at Arizona and watching the program from that vantage point or being back now, or even the first time, um, I, I think that the amount of great character people, terrific players that was, was the foundation of a long-term success. You know, it started with, uh, with a number of your recruiting classes and in particular, the one that, that you just mentioned coach, when I was here the last time our summer basketball camp, was really big. It's still big. I don't know if you know that. I'm sure like camps back when you were you were coaching, that was the thing, right? I mean, if you were a good player, you went to a place called Five Star Basketball Camp, uh, the Poconos, the BC All-Star Camp, right? Those are a long, long time ago. And then we all had our summer basketball camps. As time has moved on, I don't think camps are as prevalent across the country as they once were. Here at Xavier, our camp is still really strong. But where I'm going with it is, our camp, our campers would always have a session in Schmidt Fieldhouse. And to show you how far it's gone, you could be a third grader. And when we would say, hey, you know, the, the NBA division of our summer basketball camp, the young kids, you're going to spend the afternoon in Schmidt Fieldhouse, there would be an immense groan. <laughs> right? like, I, can't, I can't believe you're said to be to Schmidt Fieldhouse. I actually have to spend two hours in that place, right? Because there's no air conditioning, they're spoiled rotten. And uh, you think about it, that's your home court. All these players were talking about, you recruited them there. That's where the games were. That's where your offices were. But I would just be curious, when you think of Schmidt Fieldhouse, you got any stories or anything come to mind? <laughs> uh, I don't know if we have enough time. <laughs> but uh, the first one, well, I mentioned the one about um, – playing Evansville for the conference championship, the last game of the season. And Dick Walters, who's the coach of Evansville, said that a, a rat or a mouse went across the floor before the start of the game. Uh, David Anderson, who was uh, one of the good players early on in our uh, junior college player from, from Youngstown, um, Tom Worth was taking him up to the top of Schmidt Fieldhouse to let him in. And he has a bunch of keys that we, they gave us. We didn't know what the keys were for. And he's trying about four or five different keys. And, and he says, David, I'm sorry, I can't get in the door. Which might have been a good thing, because if he saw the building, he might not have come. But <laughs> um, he said, Coach, don't worry. Sometimes it be that way. <laughs> and he came, he came anyhow. And uh, he, he was he was great. Uh we lost him a couple of years ago, and, and uh, we miss him. But um, uh, those are two stories. Um, I'm trying to think. One, one that was really emotional for me was um, we're playing Loyola, Chicago, uh, and it was the day that my father had passed. And I, I learned about it in a team meeting in my suite uh, in Chicago, and um, uh, my the players heard what was going on and I didn't tell them until before the game, we went out, we lost by a point to a very good Loyola team. And, um, I, I flew from Chicago back to Connecticut to my father's funeral, came back for the Oral Roberts game about, uh, you know, three or four or five days later. And I walked into the field house and <clears throat> excuse me, got a standing ovation. Yeah, from the, from the people there, and I'll never forget it. And, yeah, uh, that's awesome. I told I told the players that in the, uh, at Loyola that my father had seen them play personally, but he saw them that night, mm -hmm. and they played their asses off. Yeah. So that that is a very 
uh, memorable. I'm sorry for getting emotional. No, no, no. Hey, hey, that's the one thing I, I think about Xavier fans. I mean, the loyalty that they have for the team and for this program. It's uh, you know, it's it's really hard to express because we've gone so long with with our sport being so essential and like the front porch of the university in many ways when it comes to athletics that it the meaning over generations is really heartfelt. They care. They really do. Yeah, they really do. And they, they, they're, they're so loyal. And um, they, they've just, you know, they've taken this thing to a new level, uh, which, yeah. you know, is important to me because that's how I, I saw it uh, in, in the future and the potential that it had when I first went there. And I'm glad that it has, it has got to that point. And, uh, you know, you should be very proud to be a part of it. The Sean Miller Podcast is proud to partner with Deer Park Roofing, a company that's provided elite service for homes and businesses since 1996 and leads the industry in professionalism, quality, and responsiveness. Whether your needs are residential or commercial, like the outstanding work on the Cintas Center, the home of Xavier Basketball, Deer Park can handle any job and ensure it's done right. Deer Park's motto is protect what's important, and what's important to you is important to Deer Park Roofing. Visit DeerParkRoofing.com. The Sean Miller Podcast is proud to partner with Payroll Partners, where you're not just a number. That means providing a best-in-class HR and payroll experience that was built on award-winning technology and live support customer service with a dedicated payroll specialist who's just a phone call away. You shouldn't have to choose between technology and customer service. At Payroll Partners, you get both. Payroll Partners is locally owned and operated by a proud Xavier alum. Visit payrollpartners.net. That's payrollpartners.net. Welcome back in here to the Sean Miller podcast. Really enjoy um, hearing Coach Stack and, and a lot of your memories and hearing you talk about your dad. I think I just I, I love that sort of stuff. I know Sean's dad was a huge part of his life growing up in basketball and still is today. My dad was a big part of my life, too. And unfortunately, he's no longer with us. But um, I, I think for a lot of people, a lot of generations of Xavier fans, like there's a certain segment of them that are always going to love Bob Stack. And and the simple reason for that is because you mentioned Bill Daly. Well, before Bill Daly hired you to come here and be the head coach, there were people at the university who thought maybe division one college basketball was not the route. It it wasn't the lane that Xavier should be in. There were some people who wanted Xavier to move to division three and Bill Daly stood up and he was the one, he was the loudest voice in the room And I know this because I wrote a whole story about it when he passed. Um, And he said, no, this is important. We're going to commit to this. This is, uh, this is something that that we should do. And he goes out and he hires you. And if you don't do what you did here at Xavier, if you don't get the program going and get it on the right track, then those people who wanted this to not be a division one program, Maybe they come back and they say, okay, we were right. Bill Daly was wrong, but that didn't happen. And, and I think that's your legacy right there in and of itself, that, that you were the guy that, that took this from being a program that people thought maybe shouldn't be Division I, and you proved those people wrong with Bill Daly's help and a lot of these guys that you went out and recruited. Well, you know, um, I'll tell you two stories about that, that transition there. Um, when I got here, you know, Bill told me about the commitment and, you know, what were, they were going to do and what I thought needed to be done. Uh, they showed me the, the office, as I mentioned to you earlier, about uh, the rickety uh, chair and desk and the phone on the – it's like a, a glorified phone booth with a, a Coke machine in there. And um, I said, you know – Bill, I can't have, I can't recruit to this office. I can't have kids come in here and sit down with me and I'm going to talk to them about their future at Xavier having this. So unless, you know, something changes pretty quick, I'm going to get on the phone. I'm calling Bob Weiner and see if I can come back to Penn. And by that afternoon, I had a new office in the o- uh, O'Connor Sports Center with the, the furniture coming in the next day. And then... Um, I think and it was the first year or the second year 
Uh, we went back to, you know, and I was trying to improve the schedule. We went back to the Palestra, where I had coached four years at Penn, going to the Final Four. We played LaSalle, and I'm interviewed before the game by Dan Baker, who was a longtime Big Five uh, radio commentator. And he said to me, he said, um, Bob, what does it feel like going to a coach's graveyard? And I looked at him, I said, coach's graveyard? I think this could be a gold mine. And I said, it's a great recruiting area. We got Eastern ties. We got, we're coming here to the Palestra to play. We're going to be attractive for people to play. We're going to build this thing. And that, so it, it wasn't just like people around Cincinnati. There was a perception out there uh, in the East or wherever else might be that, you know, maybe it couldn't get done. But I'm happy to say that we we put our nose to the grindstone and and through a lot of hard work and you know a lot of good luck, a lot of cooperation from a lot of people, uh, we're able to get it done. You know, Coach, one of the reasons we're doing this podcast is what you just talked about, and I think I have a very unique experience with Xavier because I was here as an assistant, I was here as a head coach, I left for a 13 year window, watched a lot of success. Watched the transition from the Atlantic 10 to the Big East, followed it closely. And now here I am. I came back at a a later time when we're in the Big East, completely, completely new in in different world. But when you talk about the tradition, one of the things that drove me to do this podcast is it's that word respect. And like, I'll give you a great example. Since the NCAA tournament has gone to 64 teams, which is, Adam and Paul, you can help me with the with the date. I think that's the mid-80s. Mid-1985. So we're going all the way back to 1985, a long time ago. We have the 11th most wins in college basketball during that period of time from 1985 through the beginning of 2023. 11th. If we started to talk about the 10 teams ahead of us, <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, you, you can name them just like I can, right? But think about that. When you're talking about building something, you're just not talking about building something that's had a little bit of success. You're talking about something that's had, I mean, an insurmountable amount of success and wins over decades in different conferences and coaches. And I think it's up to us, the people that are here right now, to continue to bring that to life because I believe our tradition is very understated. And I think that's part of what I'm trying to do you know, moving forward of maybe helping more players get their number retired to honoring former coaches and teams and players that have really built what we call our brand today, because look, it, it's one of the best and elite programs in the country. It really is. There, there is no question. And I, I am so proud of that. And so proud of, of you, Sean, and the other people before you that, that have taken this and moved it to another level to have the success that you're talking about. Uh, that, that is amazing to me. And, but that's, that's what I thought there was a chance to have happen um, mm-hmm. moving forward because it was just, you know, there was a commitment, there was a, an enthusiasm, and the things that have transpired since have just been great. I, I, I feel a great sense of pride. And I know I talked to a lot of people and they know that I was there back in the day and they, they have great respect for the Xavier program. And yeah. uh, it, it's it's something that, you know, we all can be proud of and be yeah. happy that we're that you're a part of it now. And and hopefully that will continue for years. Uh, I wish the hell that I had the opportunity to come back like you did. Yeah. Uh, I never <laughs> should have left. But, um, you know, it's, it's just really gratifying to know that that's where the program is right now. Yeah. What I wanted to just, if you don't mind, just touch on is, you know, as a coach, I'm fascinated with the Miami Heat. I know Eric Spolstra simply because I'm close with the Van Gundys and Stan Van Gundy and Eric Spolstra. You know, they work together in Miami, are very close to this day, and that family and Eric are, are tied together. That's my that's my one in with the Miami Heat, but I have always admired, you know, Pat Riley in the, you know, the, the heat culture and the, the way that they draft and the way you guys scout, how you build your teams and you've built it under different ages. And why I bring that up, Coach, is when I listen to you talk about recruiting, 
it reminds me of most of my time as a college basketball coach, where you're bringing young people in, campus visits, unofficial and official visits, home visits, convincing them to choose your program and school and university over another, and you know, build that relationship over time. Well, where we're at today with the transfer portal, for example, you look at the players of the year, candidates this year, you have Zach Eady at Purdue, but his competition is filled with people, players that started at one program and now they're at his second. Well, eventually we have certain players that might be at their third program. Can you, you know, imagine how different that is. So a lot of our decision making is different. It reminds me of like the NBA hitting free agency right, not just building through the draft, but making decisions on sometimes we build through the draft. Sometimes we build through free agency. You know, sometimes we acquire great role players in trades. And it just seems like the Miami Heat have always been on the cutting edge that as the NBA has changed, it just seems like you've always been a step ahead of changing. And I would just, you can't, I know you can't bring it all out, but you've been with the Heat. You're currently with the Miami Heat. I guess what is it in your mind that differentiates your organization from so many others? And if you look at it as, as I'm talking to you as a college coach, we all now have to adjust to a very new landscape. Uh, any advice you would have for me and our staff as we go into kind of a new territory? Well, you know, uh, just to give you a little bit of background, to th this is my second stint with uh, Miami Heat. I coached, uh, coached there uh, in the early 90s, and I was part of the staff that had the first uh, two playoff teams ever in Miami Heat history and uh, worked with Stan Van Gundy when uh, I was with Orlando, when he was the head coach there. And uh, Spo is a tremendous, one of the best coaches in the league. Uh, the thing that we do, um, number one, um, we want players that – uh, are committed to work. You know, they want to go out and have a good work ethic. Um, they they have to have a, a certain level of basketball intelligence to pick up things quickly and uh, to be uh, a good member of the team, a good teammate, and to bring his lunch pail to work every day. That's, that's what it is about being part of the Miami Heat and the culture that we have. And we've been fortunate to, you know, we, we get our diamonds in the rough because I think we do our homework in terms of finding people that not necessarily are the first round draft picks or, you know, get them in a, a, a second round as a, as a, a, a kind of a, a diamond in the rough. But get guys that are undrafted. You take a Gabe Vincent, you take a Max Struess, you take a Duncan Robinson, guys that have success. Two of them, uh, unfortunately, we lost because we couldn't, afford to, because of cap situations and so forth, been able to play, uh, be able to pay uh, to keep them. Uh, but, you know, Duncan Robinson's done it. We got a guy, Jaime Jaquez. Uh, I know him well, Coach. I know him. I mean, I coached against him in Arizona, uh, recruited him. You know, him and his sister both went to UCLA. I watched what he did for, you know, Mick Cronin, who we, we both know. And, uh, man, I mean, you talk about when you guys drafted him, I started to laugh. I mean, it was just I, I almost found like joy in watching that pick, because if there was ever a player that I would think about being a part of Miami Heat, it's him. It made perfect sense to me because he was always underappreciated. I told Jaime one time after his sophomore year, they beat us. I said, all these different guys are entering the draft. You're better than all of them. <laughs> and it was just he was a college player and he wasn't in a hurry to leave but you watch the success he's having and I would imagine you guys are thrilled to have him well you know you know what I saw him play as a freshman or a sophomore I can't remember which but he got hurt in the game but he, I saw him for like maybe about eight nine ten minutes of first ice and I said this is a guy I want to watch and I, I watched him and I saw him and I, I, I really thought highly of him. And then we interviewed him in Chicago. And uh, he, you know, I said, I've known Mick Cronin a long time. When I was at Xavier, his father was a high school coach at Roger Bacon. I said, mm -hmm. I know the family. I know, 
I, I, I want to ask you some questions about how you dealt with his coaching style and how you, and he told me, and when he walked, he, the answers he gave us, I said to the, uh, Adam Simon and, and uh, the rest of our uh, front office, I said, that guy is part of us. That's a guy that fits yep. what we do. And yep. fortunately, you know, it worked out where we were able to get him. So I'll tell yep. you, what, there's no question, Sean, you were dead on with him. He's a winner. He, he really is. And not only a winner, but he is an amazing kid. I mean, you know, you talk about teammate, hard worker, someone you trust on and off the court. I mean, he's he's a champion. And look, being a part of that organization, coach, you guys are, you know, you're revered in so many circles, you know, whether college coach, you know, we all watch you and say, what is it that we can do to be more like them? You know, it's like the ultimate compliment, you know. Well, the, that's the that's nice to hear. Yeah. And, I'm, and, I'm happy. I'm happy to be part of them. Because, you know, they do a lot of they do all the things that I believe in and things that I think that I I used in building the, the uh, what we did at, at Xavier back yep. in the day. And, you know, what I've tried to you know, carry on my coaching career and what I've done from a scouting standpoint. I had two questions for you, Bob. The, the, the first one was in 1982, uh, Xavier finished eight and 20. But then the next year, you finish 22-8. and eight. You go to the NCAA tournament for the first time since 1961. You, know, you, you look at this year's Xavier team and a lot of the things that they've had to overcome with injuries and a, one of the hardest schedules in the country. And by a win-loss standpoint, probably not a, a standpoint that you know a lot, of, a lot of people here are used to right now. But looking at what this program could be next year, coming with bringing players back or going to the transfer portal. I'm curious when you had that down year and then what you were able to do in transitioning into the next season, what were some of the things that you talked to your team about? What were some of the things that you were able to do, uh, you know, in going from one year to the next back then? Well, you know, that year in particular, we went from like eight and 18 to 13 and 15 the second year. And we won the, the, the regular season conference championship. And then we had a lot of players coming back. We had Steve Wolf coming in, who sat out the year before, and he was going to play. He broke his foot. That was a big, a big thing for us to get over. And you know, we just we had injury problems. We had you know some turmoil. But I knew that we had the components in the program to be able to be better. And I wasn't shocked that we went from eight and twenty because of what we had to go through to the players we had healthy and back playing with a year of maturity and to go 22 and eight. Um, and that, that was, you know, we put our nose to the grindstone. We're going to look, we're going to look for excuses. I don't think the players did, the coaching staff did. We just, you know, got ourselves in a, in a, a mindset that we were going to get this done and, and it was able to happen. So um, I, I think you just have to get people that fit into your philosophy, that buy into what you're doing and make a commitment each and every day uh, to try to get themselves to be better. And I think that's what we did. That's what I'm sure you're going to do, Sean, moving forward. And it's going to get done again. And people, you know, there's Xavier people out there that might go, oh, well, what? you know what? Be patient. Okay. Don't get spoiled. Okay. You've had a good ride. It's going to continue. But there's going to be some bumps in the road occasionally, and maybe this is a bump, and you're going to get over it, and things are going to rise again. Yeah, no, I, we're going to we're I going to clip that, that coach. Yeah. You, you know, one thing, <laughs> one thing is you're saying what a great job I did recruiting. I tried to recruit a kid from from outside of Pittsburgh one time when I was at Wake Forest. His son was he was a son of a coach, a hell of a player, and a damn guy goes to Pittsburgh. And I said, I must have done a, a bad hey, job. You, hey, you know what? You, you're in a long line of, of people that, that have lost to John Calipari. You remember he was the assistant coach. I didn't know that. Yeah, he, 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 won, won, he won me over. There. Right. He won me over in the other 300 that he, that he did, you know. But, uh, yeah, no, I remember that. That was – they talk about a connection I was thinking about. I believe you guys – you did, even did a home visit. Yeah, 
Yeah, you did a, did a home visit there in little old Beaver Falls. I'll tell you this, Coach. Beaver Falls looks the exact same today as that day you drove in to see me. <laughs> not a lot's changed. Not, not a, yeah, not a lot's changed. I love it there and the people there, but it's uh, it's it's really amazing. It's an amazing place to grow up. You know, you know what? You know what's kind of funny that you mentioned John Calipari. Well, yeah. Wayne Morgan left to go to Syracuse. So I interviewed three guys, Tony Ferentino, mm-hmm. all right? He goes to with Ronnie Rothstein to the Miami Heat. He was a coach at Mount Vernon High School. Yeah. Jerry Wainwright, who yep. I admire. Yep. yep. And the third guy, John Calipari. Oh, wow. Is that right? There you go. <laughs> right. I, I didn't do a great recruiting job there because I didn't hire him. I probably should have done that. I'd be, yeah, know, yeah. Oh. Hey, you would have been a young guy. Even I'd have you too. <laughs> <laughs> probably would have. <laughs> uh, my one other question from a Xavier perspective here, Bob, was that when you took over Cincinnati in the Crosstown shootout, we know how revered that rivalry is around this city. But Cincinnati well, had won that? eight. Can, sorry. What school, what school was that again? Uh, that would be that would be Cincinnati. <laughs> oh, the University of Clifton you're talking about. <laughs> okay, all right. Go ahead. I'm sorry, Paul. Okay, well, well that, that school, that school, Bob, had won eight straight crosstown shootouts when you took over. But in your six years, you went four and two against Cincinnati. And really since then, that's that line when you took over, if you look at the the color code, if you go to the Wikipedia page of the Crosstown Shootout and you look at the red and then you look at the blue that that, that kind of takes over from there, it was really when you took over that it started to turn blue the rest of the way. And I, I'm curious, back then, could you feel that and, and the rivalry and what it meant and as it started to sway more into, into your favor with Xavier, uh, how big and important that was? Oh, uh, uh, How important it was. I mean... There, there was a great deal of pressure that first year because, you know, oh, and I'll never forget, um, uh, I'm trying to think of his name now. Uh, anyhow, there was an alumnus came up and he ran out on the floor after we beat them, 77, I'll never forget the score, 77 to 69, all right? And he comes out and he couldn't tell, he just went, Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> and Bill Daly was there. I tell you, it was the greatest thing in the world. And we just <laughs> took it from that that one game, right? And we and they, we took a lot of BS from Ed Badger and UC because you know you talk about what what was the, your schedule eleventh in the country or what, what was the school ranking? Yeah, it's- it's it's up there, Coach. It's if we play UConn, uh, if we would play UConn in Big East uh, tournament, we actually would play a number one seed seven times this year. If you can imagine that. There you go. All right. Yeah. And Ed Badger used to say we play they had a game against Union College, and we used to have a, like a, a I don't know if you still have them these luncheons before the game, and he said, well they're playing they they got to play Onion, so we, <laughs> we called Union Onion. And we get a lot of BS about our schedule. And now look at what Xavier is playing. One of the best yeah. schedules in the country. And, yeah, and, no and really doing well doing it. So Yeah. <laughs> no, that's a, it's an amazing rivalry. You don't you don't realize it sometimes. I, I know that people outside of Cincinnati don't understand the proximity. We're four miles away, five miles oh, away. Yeah. You know, and there's so much pride in college basketball in this city. But, yeah, there's nothing like it. Well, Coach, one thing I want to say to you is, and this is a project for me, it started a year ago, and and we're going to work through it this spring and summer, but really want to create kind of like a legacy here of reaching back to the former coaches and players and teams. And, you know, we want to to make sure that you're going to be one of these people that are honored. And I, I look forward to being able to make that call and kind of share with you the future I, I, I can't share everything with you right now, but it's in the works to really, I think, uh, make that connection and, and make it a forever thing. Uh, because without people like yourself and the people that you brought here, uh, none of us would have had the trajectory that we've experienced. None of us. Well, so thank you. Just let me say that anything you need from me, uh, anything that I can do to be a part of it, 
I would love to do it. And I'm, I'm yep. at your, just pick up the phone. You have my number. We've talked. Uh, I want to talk to you again soon about, you know, some, uh, some of your guys and, you know, how they project for the future. But uh, anything that I can do, anything, be a part of, be a help to, to the program. Um, it's a love that uh, will go to my grave. Well, I appreciate it. And your guys, your players have been amazing, you know, as, as I've come back and just uh, their love for this place. You feel it when they're around and we want to get them back even more. And uh, and that's that's really what I need your help the most is just to make sure that we can just have that connection. Because I think once it's made and once it's established, and in some cases reestablished, I, I think it's a forever thing. So it's yeah. important because that's what the greatest programs in college basketball have, and we're one of them. Yeah, there's no question. And I'm happy for you, and I congratulate you. And uh, anything I can do to help to enhance that, I, I'd be happy to do it. Awesome. Well, Bob, thanks so much for joining the show today. We really appreciate it. We'll talk to you again sometime soon. This has been the Sean Miller Podcast presented by Deer Park Roofing, the official payroll sponsor of the Sean Miller Podcast, payroll partners, and our friends at TG Solar. Bob, thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Coach. Good with you. Thanks, Sean. Talk you soon. This has been the Sean Miller Podcast presented by Deer Park Roofing with your hosts, Paul Fritchner and Adam Bow. Join us again soon for another episode with the head coach of the Xavier Musketeers, Sean Miller. Life as a student here at Xavier, you, you have the best of both worlds. You have this small Jesuit private school with a really intimate campus where I think everybody seems to know each other. You walk into a classroom, the professor knows your name, you obviously know the professor and you, and you know your classmates. However, you're not in a small college town where that's all we have. It's just the opposite. You can access the city in quick five minutes. You have the professional sports scene. The diversity of a huge city over the Rhine, what it's become is just incredible. It, it really is. Some of the, the places that we all can go. And for a student at Xavier too, it just continues to offer the best of both worlds. I, I really believe that's one of our strengths at Xavier. It's an amazing way of getting a great education.